With that all done, we move on to the Delta episode. Okay, not really. This thing is basically a giant three-hour fetch quest. So we're only going to be going over like the four battles in the entire thing. Courtney or Matt will be the first battle here, and they only have one Pokemon. Even with Eruption and Crunch as their only good stabs, they're nothing. Moving on to the Granite Cave, we face Zinnia for the first time. Tyrantrum, not bad. Strong, good moves, but Altaria, not so much. Lower Salamence, very strong. But she only has three Pokemon, which, not great. But she can at least do some solid damage but it isn't the biggest threat of all time. Then at the Space Center, despite a Mega, both Courtney and Matt, only three Pokemon are there, especially a weak Mightyena really doesn't help, but, an, but Camera Up's Eruption or Sharpedo's Crunch poses a slight threat to one Pokemon. But they don't really have the staying power in speed or bulk, respectively. After that, you face Sutapalan Wallace as a test to enter the Spear Pillar. Using a team some fans from Emerald may recognize, he's decked out with the latest moves that these Pokemon can learn. A decently strong whale, or a tentacruel with actual rain support, it definitely can do a whole lot of damage with Brine, especially in rain. Ludicolo with Swift Swim, Rain Boosted Scalds, they're pretty big terror. And with odd typing and actually pretty decent bulk, not bad. Whiskash, though, is not great, but at least it can, of course, do some rain support and take on electric types. Clearing the path for my Lotic and Gyarados, which is fantastic. Intimidate, fantastic. Beefed up by rain, its waterfalls are devastating, and its coverage is not bad, especially Stone Edge. Naturally, his my Lotic is his ace. Hydro Pump, fantastic. Great bulk, recover, Blizzard. This thing, of course, can take on Grass and Dragon types and still come out on top, and it can still hammer Electric types with pretty solid to sting backing it up. It's a great Pokemon. His team, not bad. After that, you face Zinnia after catching Rayquaza. Her leadoff of a Gudra is actually not terrible. It's bulky in a decent way. Move pool is actually quite decent. It's not a pushover. Same, of course, applies to her Tyrantra. Raltaria is the weak link. Same of Noivern. They're just not strong or bulky enough to really do enough. Despite, of course, they're actually pretty decent coverages. But all of that pales before her Mega Salamence. Bulky, ruthlessly aggressive, this thing's stats rival and even surpass a same leveled Rayquaza. And after Intimidate, this thing can take physical hits exceptionally well. If it's gonna go down, it's gonna go down leaving some scars. That when, with the Delta episode concluded, the Elite Four and Steven await your rematches. Sydney's Mark II team is actually much better, though that isn't exactly hard. Intimidate Scrafty is not bad, it is capable of taking hits quite well, and though Fairy will completely annihilate it, it does at least have some punishment in return for what's going to face it. Shiftery and Sharpedo are both unchanged, but his new Zoroark is actually quite okay. It's not the extremely strong thing ever, but it's actually not horrible. Mandibuzz is not a pushover. It's bulky, even if it's not packing huge amounts of damage, it does have some pretty decent chip down and tailwind support. His Mega Absol, on the other hand, is a monster. It is immune to any status move being thrown against it because of magic bounce, and it's fast, pretty strong attack stats. Really not much needs to be said. It's frail, yes, but it's not terrible. Phoebe, her Bayonet is not great outside of course its ability to Toxic or a Grudge. Her Miss Magius is not terrible. It's got a good move in Pain Split, it's got some pretty decent special stats, very fast, and it's not especially frail outside of, of course, physical moves. So Pain Split can actually do some good work. If it can survive a hit, Pain Split, recover its health, damage an opponent. It is the most powerful thing, but it's not terrible. Drift Blim is bulky. Its moves are not exactly the greatest thing outside of Acrobatics, and Phantom Force is not horrible. It's like a Gun Icy Wind are some interesting tech. It's not exactly the greatest thing though it can drop the speed of opposing Pokemon, so that way it can, of course, damage before them. Not bad. It's not bad, but it's not especially great. Chandelure, though, is a monster. We've been over them before. They're terrifying. Fantastic special attack. Really not much need to say. Dusknor is bulky. Not the greatest moves, given its lower attacking power, but it's not bad. Her Mega Sableye, though, is beastly. 
gargantuan defenses. Foul play will punish any physical attacker trying to muscle in and break through its pure bulk. Its inability to target dice status is terrifying. Glacia is no one to joke at. Snow Warning Blizzard Obama Snow is actually quite strong considering that she does have an ice type team. Even if it doesn't have the greatest of stellar offenses, it's not terrible. Bear Tick does benefit from Snow Cloak, and it does have a vicious icicle crash. Same with Frost last with Snow Cloak and the Blizzard. It also has Hail to set up and redundancy if removed. Blizzard is solid, Shadow Ball and Draining Kiss are not as great. But an Ice Body Vanillix is actually quite stellar, giving a little bit of sustain, and Freeze Dry is not bad. Wall Rain is, of course, bulky. Surf, great moves. Blizzard, fantastic. Mega Galalee is actually quite strong. It is decently fast, has pretty good offenses, and Freeze Dry, yeah, pretty good. But really, that's all it's got going for it. And now on to Drake. Up first, Altari. Not great. Bulky-ish, yes, but not overly, and it doesn't really do much well. His Dragalgi is actually quite interesting. It's an awkward type combination, and it does have some decent power for the bulk it's got. Some interesting coverage moves. Kingdra has been over. Fantastic, great kit. Flygon is not great. Yes, Boom Burst is strong, and Dragon Pulse does have some stab. Flamethrower is nice coverage, but it's not a great special attacker. It's not the baddest thing. It's not the best thing ever. Haxor is, though, picks up any slack Flygon could be leaving. Dragon Claw, Earthquake, what more do you need? With great speed and great offense on top of that. We've been over Mega Salamence already. <laughs> this thing's a monster. Bulky, fast, aggressive, strong moves. There's not much to say. And now, on to Steven and his Mark II team. Most of his team is actually the same as before. Still has some great setup. Agron still has its offensive moves. The difference really comes down to two Pokemon. Carbink, which, not great, it's a Pokemon that is all bulk, but it only has attacking moves. Aerodactyl is not bad, but it's also not great. It's got a decent, it's got a good Rock Slide, but the Fangs are not especially great. His Mega Metagross is, of course, still a monster. It's bulky, it's fast, it's aggressive, backed up by Tough Claws, this thing doesn't mess around. And that wraps up Azor. Yes, I'm still going to be calling it that. Get used to it. And yeah, this game shows that the problems of X and Y weren't anything to do with the EXP share because this game itself has the same EXP share. It really came down to just bad teams. Now, I could have pretty much gone through the game, run through it really quickly, and because everyone knows that X and Y is very easy, didn't really need to go too heavy on things here. I kind of did not I kind of didn't. In this way, I did go over a lot of things more in detail, but I also didn't spend as much time on them as needed. Mostly because, yes, we know X and Y is very easy. This game really does bring things back, and it is actually a more difficult game than X and Y. It actually is, in its own right, actually quite difficult. Yes, the enemy teams, such as Team Mag, yes, the enemy Team Magma and Team Aqua, they're not great. Their Pokemon are bad, but... Many of the gym leaders do actually have very good teams. In fact, they're actually on par with some of the teams that really Black and White and Black to White do had in many ways. Same with the Elite Four. Not exactly the greatest of teams for the Elite Four, mind you. There are definitely some problems with them, but their league's better than anything X and Y had. And this really continues for everything. Everything pretty much in this game is just a lot more difficult, better team compositions overall, one of the main problems of X and Y was just the fact that things have low stats relative to what you're facing. Pokemon, if they were five levels lower in that fight, in any of those battles, would actually be a lot better, just because just of the ridiculous level climb rate that X and Y has. You're pretty much level 40 by around the fifth gym. That's where you're at in most games by gym seven or eight. And that's really where the game gets really easy. Starters have the best stats in the game, and not a lot of Pokemon in the game actually have good stats. Azor really shows that was the problem. Levels here don't climb at a ridiculously high rate, and the Pokemon that the AI do use are actually quite competent in terms of stats and very good in moves. Yes, the rivals are not hard, but the rivals really haven't been hard outside of a few fights with Barry in Generation 4 and Gen 5 Rivals. So, not bad, it's not much of a departure. Even outside the Delta episode, this game is actually quite difficult comparatively, 
to X and Y. I wouldn't say it stacks up to something such as Black 2 and White 2 as well, but they are quite good in their own right. Again, not as hard as those games, but it is definitely a step up from X and Y, which is really all we are looking at here. So, see you guys next time when we say Alola to Gen 7.